This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. It's the end of the year and time for our annual mini stories episodes. Mini stories are these fun, quick hit stories that maybe came up in our research for another episode, or they were just some cool thing that someone told us about. It, it could be from a friend, someone on Twitter, a relative, Avery's dad, just some story <laughs> that we found really interesting. But it didn't quite warrant a full episode and two months of hard reporting. But they're great 99PI stories nonetheless. And my favorite part is we do them as unscripted interviews where I'm in the studio with the people who work on this show who I like a lot. This is the greatest team in all of podcast land. I guarantee you that. This week we have stories about 60s cult TV shows, semi-useless gadgets, woo-woo miracle cures, and a modern Christmas tradition. It's going to be fun. Up first is Avery Truffman. Okay. Okay. (laughs) What do you got? I have for you um, my oldest article of clothing. (laughs) Uh, I'm interested. Yeah. I've I've worn this my whole life. Okay. You can feel. I can feel it's soft. It is a soft gray t-shirt. I've been wearing that weirdo shirt since I was like three. (laughs) So clearly my parents gave it to me. (laughs) Right. I mean, I definitely remember it went down to your knees. <laughs> well, how, why you took it, I don't know. Or maybe, again, I don't know. I don't think I, I said, had the agency to take it. I bet you put it on me. The shirt is 25 years old. I don't remember. At least 25 years old. This is my dad, the giver of this shirt to me. Should I read what's on it? Yes, read what's on it. <laughs> okay. Where am I? In the village. What do you want? Information. Whose side are you on? That would be telling. We want Information. 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 You won't get it. By hook or by crook, we will. We will. Sorry, I have to scroll down. (laughs) Scroll down. It's a shirt. (laughs) This is real life. (laughs) Okay, here we go. Okay, get serious. I get my serious voice on. Who are you? you? The new number two. two. Who is number number one? one. You You are number six. Number six. I am not a number. I am a free man. I am not a number. I am a free man! (laughs) I know what this is. (laughs) What is it, Roman? This is a t-shirt from The Prisoner. And uh, my dad's going to help us explain what The Prisoner is. The Prisoner was an extraordinary television series made, I think, in 1966. And it was during the 60s when you had the whole James Bond secret agent, you know, thing. So The Prisoner is a 1960s TV show about a British spy, played by Patrick McGowan, who mysteriously resigns and then that evening is abducted. And he finds himself in this mysterious place called The Village. The Village is this odd little town he doesn't know where it is. He doesn't know what it is, that it's just a very strange little place. So the village, like, it, it's very disorienting because it seems to be kind of removed from all other countries in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, like, castles and villas and townhouses, and they're all smashed together. And it could be absolutely anywhere. And it's completely beautiful mm-hmm. and perfect. Mm-hmm. But, like, too perfect. Everything is relentlessly cheerful. And everybody has to, you know, good good afternoon, we're having a parade. So there are all kinds of mandatory parades and events and festivals and no one has names and everyone goes by a number. And again and again, the spy, now known only as number six, has no idea who imprisoned him in this relentlessly cheery place where the people are wearing peppy striped shirts and suits with white piping and they're wearing rainbow capes and Ked sneakers. But the greeting from everybody is, be seeing you. Be seeing you. Which on one hand sounds very innocuous. You know, see you later. But what it meant was not see you later. It means that we're watching you. Come one, come all. Be seeing you. So the whole village is under constant surveillance all the time. Mm-hmm. And in every episode, the members of the village are trying to break number six, and they put him through elaborate mind games and challenges and temptations, trying to figure out why he resigned. And the spy can't leave the village or a giant weather balloon will come after him and smother him. And the show only lasted like 17 episodes or so. And it was really crazy. James Bond meets 
Doctor Who. On acid. Yeah. The show gets weirder and weirder with each progressing episode, right? Yes. It eventually sort of went off the rails. Everybody just went crazy. So the very last episode doesn't make any logical sense. It's completely crazy. Right. But at the beginning of this bonkers, absurdist, crazy episode was something that my dad found truly shocking. At the beginning of the opening very last episode, they reveal the location of the village in real life. And just like, oh, my God, this place really exists. What the hell is this place? So the village looks like a set, but it's a real place. And for my whole life, as long as I have been wearing that weird shirt, (laughs) my dad has wanted to go there. Mm -hmm. And this year, he finally did. You know, it's in a remote corner of Wales. Uh, It wasn't easy to get there. Wow. Here's the backstory. Mm Mm-hmm. After World War I, there was this Welsh architect named Sir Bertram Clough Williams Ellis, and he was kind of dismayed by how the UK was rebuilding after, after World War I, mm-hmm. and all these gorgeous old buildings were getting torn down, or they just weren't bothering to rebuild in the beautiful classical style. They were building big, brutalist concrete blocks. Right. And so when he acquired this remote plot of land in 1925 in uh, his home country of Wales, he decided to bring the beauty of the whole of Europe back to his homeland, <laughs> literally. And as, as Ellis would travel around the world, he'd find a colonnade or a building or a church or maybe the top two floors of a church, dismantle it, ship it to, to Port Myron and rebuild it. My dad calls it Port Myron, but every <laughs> British person that I've heard <laughs> calls it Port Marion. And from 1925 to 1975, Clough, Clough William Ellis, Williams Ellis, hunted for all these crumbling remains of castles and houses and villas across the continent, especially the Mediterranean, and rescued them by bringing them to this one spot. And wow. to kind of fund it, it became a resort. I've never seen anything like it because usually when you think of a hotel, it's a building. But this is 35 buildings in an isolated area. And each building, is, I mean, besides, you know, the restaurants and the support thing, it's, it's, you have to think of it as like a miniature Disneyland. Except, unlike Disneyland, everything's actually real. Right. Like, it's all actually old architecture. But apparently, I mean, here, I have these books that you can, you can look at pictures of it. <laughs> these are my dad's, my dad's literature. Um, but it l- still looks quite Disney-esque because it's all painted, these bright colors. Yeah, it really does. I mean, it, like, I would have never thought it was real uh, from what I've seen of it. Yeah. That's crazy. It's almost like, why would you go to the effort of doing it for real <laughs> when, it, when it looks so fake? But it does remind me that when we look at old architecture, we ex- expect to see the weathering of it. And if you really do restore it, it is bright and shiny and odd and brightly colored and pink and bright yellows and things like that. Although, like, Clock Williams Ellis kind of took it a step further because mm-hmm. he added, <laughs> he, like, added stuff. He would put in fake windows that weren't really there. He'd, like, paint them on. And he added stairways that didn't go anywhere just because he thought they looked scenic and added these windy paths. So he also kind of, like, turned it into this tutti-frutti playground of actual... And it, and and the cool thing was, it was postmodernism before postmodernism. Yeah, like, totally. it looks like a lot of styles that we would recognize now where they're smashing you know, colonnades on villas, on um, gothic clock towers, and painting it all bright colors. And so in a weird way, like it must have looked extra crazy in the 60s when Mm -hmm. no one was doing that. Oh, totally. Although, you know, maybe without having gone through postmodernism, you would just see it as this uh, weird collage, whereas we might now have the language of Disney and cheesy postmodernism to apply to this thing? Like maybe it looks cheap to us because of our lived experience of these things, but it might have just felt opulent and amazing to somebody before postmodernism existed. Funny you say that. The architecture (laughs) critic Lewis Mumford wrote in 1964, Port Marion is a gay, deliberately irresponsible reaction against the dull sterilities of so much that passes as modern architecture today. Uh, So it was like... Shocking. No one had seen anything like it. And yeah. Frank Lloyd Wright went to visit it. Gregory Peck came to visit. Ingrid Bergman came to visit. Brian Epstein from the Beatles uh, would stay there. Oh. Uh, uh, George Harrison stayed there. A lot of 
British uh, celebrities and stuff would go there because it was so isolated and it was so beautiful and they treated everybody with a sense of discretion. So it was this place that was kind of separate from the rest of the world and removed from time and context where your name didn't matter. Mm -hmm. Basically all the stuff that made it unbearable for number six. (laughs) I was there for the Prisoner Appreciation Society weekends. You had people walking around in prisoner costumes and they were reenacting episodes. My dad was there for this thing called uh, Port Maricon, which is basically like a giant cosplay event (laughs) for the prisoner where everyone, they do parades and they pretend to abduct people and there's a giant balloon floating around. Uh, everyone's wearing striped capes and keds, except my dad. You know, it was a little... A little much. It was a little too much. I, I enjoyed the spectacle. I wasn't up for the lifestyle. Still, it was kind of cool because this is my dad's favorite show. He mm-hmm. loves this show. And so for him, it was kind of visiting an old friend yeah. because like, they tried to remake The Prisoner kind of recently. They tried to do an American version of it. It was terrible. It was terrible. I don't know what else to say. It was just terrible. Because my dad says it just can't work without the main star and visionary, Patrick McGowan. He's the one who made it weird. But it also couldn't work without Port Marion. I think if The Prisoner were done in like a Star Trek thing, it it, it wouldn't have worked. What made it so incongruous that you were in this natural environment and these beautiful old buildings, that's what I think made it even more horrifying because it was so pleasant and it was so cute and it was so charming and it was so analog. And so that's the cool thing about the prisoner and Port Marion itself. It's not trying to be just a tribute to the past or a vision of the future. It's just kind of this like amalgamated alternative reality. But in a weird way, in both cases with Port Marion and the prisoner, they just turned into alternate realities that look like what we have today, (laughs) which is, you know, uh, postmodernism and Disneyland and also this like world of constant surveillance and constant cheeriness. It shows that the the sort of fantastic nightmare that McGowan was predicting in some cases is certainly now technologically possible. And that's totally why I still wear the shirt. <laughs> also because it's soft. <laughs> <laughs> it is very soft. That's awesome. Thank you, Avery. Thanks. Be seeing you. Be seeing you. Up next, this is producer Vivian Lee. So I'm just remembering right now that the first time you appeared on this show was last year's mini stories before you were a staff member at 99PI. Yeah, it's my 99PI anniversary. <laughs> That's so nice. This well, is I'm so s- great. I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> and um, so, what is your mini story as a staff member? Okay, so I'm going to start this with another question. Okay. So you travel a lot, right? I do travel a lot. And you travel with devices, right? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Okay. So have you ever been on the road and one of your batteries runs out of power? Absolutely. The one on the phone, it's like 5 or 6 p.m. consistently. That's the way it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Oh, yeah. It's, It's the rule. It has to run out of battery. Yes. But how useful would it be if I told you that there was an AC free battery powered battery charger that would let you fully charge that one battery and all it needs are 12 batteries of the same type? To recharge that one dead battery. Well, I would, that doesn't sound very useful. That sounds a little uh, wasteful. Yes. <laughs> it's not useful, but at the same time, it's not entirely unuseless. <laughs> That's true. That's true. It's not entirely, I could still use that thing, that monstrosity that you are describing. Right. So, yeah, the AC free battery powered battery charger is something that actually exists. Wow. And it's one example of something called chindogu, which is the art of designing nearly useless gadgets. Wow. Okay. So what do you mean exactly by nearly useless? So a chindogu is a very specific type of invention that sets out to solve one particular problem, but it actually ends up causing so much more of an inconvenience (laughs) that it's almost entirely useless. Right. So in the case of the battery-powered battery charger, you'd technically solve your problem of having one dead battery, right? but you'd make a much larger problem by draining 12 other other batteries batteries. to power it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it comes from the Japanese word chin, meaning weird or strange, and dogu, meaning tool. So strange tool. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so do you have another example? There are literally thousands of them. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, <laughs> there's a, a pair of high heels with training wheels attached to the heels. <laughs> so if you're just learning how to walk in high heels, you have a little bit of a, a little, little carrier right there. <laughs> um, there's a Zen kitty litter box. So you can practice the art of sand raking while you're cleaning up cat crap. <laughs> um, but do you want to know what my favorite chindogu I is? I absolutely need to know what your favorite chindogu is. A solar-powered flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you technically could use it, but you wouldn't really actually use it. Yeah, you couldn't possibly use it. So so where do these ideas come from? And does anyone actually make them? Or are they just ideas? Okay, so you could probably tell by the name, but it started in Japan with a man named Kenji Kawakami. Meet Kenji Kawakami, Japan's famous inventor of the useful and absurd. His creations range from umbrellas for shoes to hair splash guards, to chopsticks with fans. So Kawakami studied aeronautical engineering in college, and uh, he's always been interested in engineering and design, and he came up with the concept and started making his own creations sometime in the 1980s. But somehow he actually ended up in publishing, which is kind of how Chindogu took off. Huh. So what kind of publishing was he doing? Was he was he publishing these like these items? No, no. So in the early 90s, he was the editor of a Japanese catalog called Mail Order Life, mm-hmm. which is, you know, like one of those home shopping magazines. Right, right. Um, and so there was this one month when he realized there were some spare blank pages in the back. Oh. Um, so instead of just leaving them blank, he decided to include some images of these unuseless inventions that he'd been tinkering around in his workshop with. <laughs> um, so, you know, they weren't for sale or anything, but, you know, he thought it'd be just kind of a fun joke to slip in. Right. So he had uh, the solar- solar-powered flashlight, which I mentioned mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. and also a pair of eye drop glasses, which are essentially a pair of glasses with funnels over the lenses. Mm-hmm. So you could just put eye drops in and they'll funnel directly into your eyeballs, <laughs> like a little hole, so right. it just drip right in. Right. And, you know, the, the readers ended up getting such a kick out of them that, you know, he started putting chindogus in every issue after that. Right. Um, and so after a few years of doing this, this American journalist and translator named Dan Papia came across it. And uh, he was like, I have to spread this to the rest of the world. (laughs) And so the two of them together founded the International Chindogu Society and established the 10 tenets of Chindogu. (laughs) And so so these have rules. So so what are some of the tenets to make it a truly uh, a true Chindogu? Okay, so the first rule is that a chindogu has to be almost completely useless. So if you've created something that's actually useful, you failed. <laughs> right. You're done. Um, the second rule is that it has to actually exist. So you have to actually build a chindogu. Oh, good. So I was actually wondering this. So so you can't just make this hypothetical, even, you know, like a, a picture in a mail order catalog. You actually have to make yeah, the thing. Ha- yeah, it has to be. That's great. It has to be birthed into the world. I like that rule. Yes. Cool. Um, and so the third rule is actually my favorite. Mm-hmm. It says, inherent in every chindogu is the spirit of anarchy. And then it goes on to say, they represent freedom of thought and action, the freedom to challenge the suffocating historical dominance of conservative utility. <laughs> so so I, I think I'm getting so like a little bit of this is a is an exercise in rebellion for the uber designed product that is perfect, that ha- that does its job with great efficiency. And it's like it like frees you to have weirdo inventions that don't that function but don't actually function well yes okay so yeah we tend to marry utility and design right and they don't have to be that that is totally true they and, don't have to be yeah and it, i mean it seems a little strange to use absurdist design as a form of anarchy mm-hmm. um but before kawakami got into publishing he was actually a radical activist in the 60s and 70s hmm. and so the spirit of nonconformity and anti-consumerism is something that's rooted in the concept of chindogu Hmm. Um, there's actually a couple other tenants that dictate you can't sell the invention for money hmm. and you also can't patent it because it belongs to everybody. <laughs> so chindogas are supposed to be like the embodiment of design without the restrictive threat of materialism. <laughs> and you can tell by the way that he talks about it, like as silly as it kind of appears, he, he intended them to be fun, like a fun way to change the world. So this no, no. I believe that if everybody shares my idea of changing perceptions, he says, the world could change. One invention at a time. (laughs) 
And so what happened to Chindogu as a movement? What, you know, these big lofty ideas. Right, right. Yeah, You know, it did spread internationally. There are Chindogu societies and competitions all over the world. But Kawakami actually ended up putting um, a bunch of books out with unuseless inventions that he's made over the years or that people have submitted into the Chindogu society. Mm-hmm. Um, but since one of the tenants is that you can't make money from Chindogu, he actually ended up donating a lot of the money to charity. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. And I like I, this story. I you know. He's a, he's a good guy. Um, but I actually have one of his books here. Oh, cool. That was published originally in 1995. Mm-hmm. And can you tell me what you see here? Okay, let's see. It is a camera on a long stick with a plunger to force the shutter of the camera. This is a look, selfie stick. That is stick. a selfie stick <laughs> from 1995. It's called a self-portrait camera stick. Do it yourself without a, a palaver? I have I no what idea what that is. That is but <laughs> so if you're traveling alone or as a couple, it's hard to get pictures with you in them. It can be embarrassing to have to ask someone to take a photo for you, confusing if they don't speak your language, even costly if the third party regards your camera as a gift. <laughs> With a 57-centimeter telescoping pole, your dilemma is over. Expanding to three times its length for a full shot of you, your companion, and your environs, your only problem will be that all your shots will capture you in the act of holding a pole. This this can become a tiresome feature of your photo album unless you really like poles. (laughs) And it's a full-on selfie stick. Yeah. That's amazing. And this was 10 years before the patent for the selfie stick came out. Wow. Yeah. So I don't know if Kawakami failed at making a chindogu or Uh, if we failed as a society because (laughs) people are still using selfie sticks. I think we failed as a society. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Vivian. That's great. Thank you. So I'm in the studio with Emmett Fitzgerald, producer here at 99% Invisible. How are you doing? <laughs> good. How are you, Roman? I'm good. Um, so what is your mini story today? All right. Um, so my mini story is about blue glass. Oh. Um, and specifically, it's about this strange period in the mid to late 19th century when people thought that blue glass or the light passing through a blue pane of glass could solve just about any problem you could possibly have. And this all goes back to a Civil War general. General Augustus J. Pleasanton was a um, soldier in the Civil War, and he was a gentleman scientist. He did a lot of reading. So this is Jenny Benjamin, and she's the curator of the Museum of Vision in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Cool cool place. Check it out. (laughs) Um, And she has looked into this guy, General Pleasanton, and she says that, you know, he he was kind of this this armchair scientist really shooting from the hip. (laughs) And he had all kinds of of wacky scientific theories, but but one of them had to do with blue light. And he and he reasoned that. You know, the, the blue color of the sky, mu- the, there must be some inherent value to that color mm-hmm. and that blue light uh, was part of like what facilitated the growth of plants and animals and in biological processes. So he built, Pleasanton that is, built a garden nursery in his backyard with uh, alternating blue planes of glass. And um, he ran a, quote, experiment to see how well the vegetables would grow. So this is like a, like a greenhouse. Yes, like a green. But I didn't want to use the term greenhouse because it was a blue house. <laughs> and when she says, quote, experiment, <laughs> what does yeah, she mean? Yeah, I mean, it, it, she's, she's hinting at, you know, this wasn't exactly the most scientific <laughs> gentleman scientist. Um, <laughs> but, you know, basically he was growing grapes inside of this glass house with mm-hmm. a certain amount of the windows tinted blue. Okay. Um, and, you know, you can kind of imagine what happens next in the story, right? I mean, like, <laughs> I think so. Pleasanton reports, of course, that his plants grew to incredible size. So then he expanded the experiment and he created um, an animal pen. I believe it was for pigs. Um, and he claimed the pigs grew to enormous size and it was all because of the blue, the blue light. 
<laughs> oh, it's so great. Yeah, right. It's Everything, the you know, breakthrough of the century. Exactly. And so, you know, word <laughs> starts to get out about these experiments. And he actually starts giving talks kind of around around the country, extolling, you know, the virtues of, of blue light. Um, he even got a patent or he applied for a patent for what um, what he called his cerulean process, which I, <laughs> I love that. I think that's a really amazing <laughs> name. Um, and, uh, you know, accor- this is according to him, but he says the patent officer came to his farm um, and this is what he supposedly said. If my investigation should establish the verity of your statements, you have made the most important discovery of the century, transcending in importance even that of Morse's telegraph, which at best furnished only a means of communication with distant places, while your discovery could be brought home to every living object on the planet. Your patent would be one of the most valuable ever issued in the United States. Wow. That's some high tentative praise. Yeah, right, exactly. And he, get, he gets the patent. Uh, <laughs> And, and, you know, and then he, he goes on to write a book about this, about, you know, how blue light, that it's a panacea. And it was uh, touted as a cure-all, right? Everything from skin conditions to your eyesight. Also baldness, insomnia, back pain, more serious diseases. He basically was saying, you know, this can do everything. And the book was really popular. Like, it sold a lot of gobbies, um, and it had all these testimonials in it of people saying, oh, this, like, made my pig giant, or this, like, cured my <laughs> paraplegic child, or, or whatever. Um, and, and, and so... Uh, for about two years, like, 1876 and 1877, there was suddenly this, this huge fad for all things blue. There were blue eyeglasses. She showed me a pair of blue eyeglasses from this period at the Museum of Vision. There was blue wallpaper. But the, the big thing was blue windows. Right. Um, so people would build like little sun porches um, and put you know, one blue glass window, mm-hmm. you know, thinking that, you know, if you could spend time bathing in the blue light, <laughs> that that would cure whatever right. ailed you. And this has become known as the blue glass craze. <laughs> and so when did the blue glass craze come crashing down when people realized it didn't work at all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, quickly. <laughs> it lasted it lasted a couple of years. Um, and, you know, like the whole time that it was going on, there were people that were kind of poking fun. The same way, you know, happens now when people believe in pseudoscientific things. Right. There were editorials written about these idiots installing blue glass all through their houses. Mm-hmm. But the, the real sort of nail in the coffin um, was this, you know, scientific American. I mean, it speaks to... It speaks to how um, widespread it was that Scientific American took it upon themselves to like right. thoroughly debunk it in <laughs> in their pages. Um, so there was a really long article just debunking every aspect of this science. And you know, just to be perfectly clear about this, there is there is no way that color by itself or colored light is going to cure your eye disease or any disease. Go see your doctor. So are there any of these blue windows left, like, out in the world? Yeah, I I asked Jenny that. Are there, like, remnants of this era that you can see today, like, windows in buildings anywhere, or...? That is a really good question. I don't know if there are any buildings with blue windows uh, specifically because of this, but I bet it's somewhere. I would not be surprised. We could go chase some down, probably. (laughs) If we were to find this mythical house with its window pane, it would probably be just one blue window. <laughs> oh, please tell me you found it. Well, okay. So one of the most comprehensive pieces of writing about this era was by um, the writer Paul Collins. Oh, he's so great. He's like one of my favorites. He's yeah, so good. yeah. He's a re- he's a really good historical writer. Yeah, um, totally. And he, you know, he wrote a chapter about Augustus Pleasanton in one of his books. And and in the chapter, he talks about about himself finding a window, a blue glass window, when he was living in San Francisco. And so I called him up to sort of talk about that. Yeah, I just was, you know, looking at houses as I walked along. And there was this one with sort of a front or like parlor type of area that had blue glass panes in it. And, and, you know, he's not 100% sure that this is from that era. For all I know, that might have just been like some hippie in 1970 that decided that would be a cool thing to do. But the age of the house was such that it it, it was like the right era <laughs> for for that to have been uh, an original a bit of that fat. 
in the book, he talks about how it's between these two gas stations on this one street in sort of the sunset in San Francisco. Right. And so I did some like Google Street View sleuthing. Okay. Um, and so here, check it out. So here is the house. And you can see, yeah, these two panes here. I see. And he thinks that this little entryway on the house is uh, is one of these sort of sun porches. That's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And you can tell, you know, it's like it's like a kind of older looking it, house on the block. It is, yeah. No, it's a Victorian and it looks like a, it could be from that era. Right. Uh, for sure. And so, you know, I decided to go check it out. Oh, awesome. In between the Shell station and the Chevron. Let's see what we can find. No. Oh, no. It's gone. It's gone. The house is gone. No. Oh, no. <laughs> so it was It was gone. The house had been turned into, like, a condo. <laughs> oh. So even that picture from Google Street View is out of date. Yeah. And, and, and the crazy thing is that that was from... 2017. Wow. So I went there. I was like fairly confident. I was like, oh, I'm going to find it. I'm going to like knock on, on the, the door, door and be like, be like, hey, like, wh- what do you think about these blue glass? Like, does it make you feel any better? <laughs> <laughs> like, how healthy are you? <laughs> and I get there and that house with the blue windows has been torn down and now there's a giant box with a huge clear window. It's really ugly. I try not to be nostalgic about architecture. And buildings, but this one really looks terrible. <laughs> and worst of all, the glass is clear. Yeah, clear glass. What a bummer. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> the story, after my long search, I still have not found a blue glass window. You know, if anyone out there is. If anyone has there. I mean, there's got to, there's, there's certainly houses that are extant from that era. I mean, let, right, us, it let seems, us know. It seems, uh, it seems plausible that someone out there has got one of these windows we could take a look at that would be awesome cool thank you so much yeah thank you up next we'll have one more christmas themed mini story you're going to want this for your christmas party banter right after this Our final mini story of the day comes from senior producer Katie Mingle. You know what would make it really cozy in here, Roman? (laughs) It's not cozy enough, this three by five box. It's actually like so hot in here, but just (laughs) roll with me. Okay, okay. What would make it cozy in here? A fire. Well, I wouldn't recommend starting a fire in here right now, though. (laughs) Okay, but what we could do, we could go to YouTube and find ourselves a Yule log. Do you want me to go to YouTube right now? Yeah, will you? Yeah, sure. Just a a tiny bit of history. A Yule log um, is an old term for a certain type of fire that people would burn at Christmas with like a special log. Oh, okay. Um, But now often when people talk about a a Yule log, they're talking about like um, like this. So uh, click on that. Oh, this 10 10 hours of crackling logs for Christmas. Okay. It does its job. As soon as the fire starts crackling, like... It's relaxing. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. This idea of putting a fireplace on TV so that you could watch it as if, you know, you had a fire in your home actually goes back to 1966. Cool. And it started at this uh, little television, local television station in New York City called WPIX. And um, and yeah, it was kind of the brainchild of the the station manager, a guy named Fred Thrower. Um and he, you know how people are always like looking for holiday content, right. like ra- like we know this from working in radio. And it was really an idea in his head that he wanted to give city dwellers uh, the luxury and the warmth of a Yule log fire who didn't have fireplaces in their apartment. So that's Chip R. Curry. He's he's kind of an amateur historian of this original Yule log. The location for the first shoot of the U-Log in 1966 was Gracie Mansion, which was the mayor's residence and still is. Mm -hmm. Uh, At the time, the mayor was John Lindsay. 
and he gave them permission to come and film the ulog, WPIX, their filming crew. And they did, but there was a mishap where a spark flew out and it damaged a very expensive oriental rug. <laughs> so yeah, this was this was like a four thousand dollar rug apparently and they really messed it up. <laughs> But anyway, they got their footage. Um, they put it on the air. Uh, it was a three-hour-long broadcast with a, a loop of this fire, and it, it would air on Christmas Eve, and you'd turn on your TV to Channel 11. Um, and it, it started actually started with, like, a, this little kind of Christmas time, you know, special message from someone at the station. It The one that I found online, it's just, it's, it's just striking because it's... Um, how to put this? It's very Jesus forward. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it. And more than any other person in history, Jesus taught us to respect the godliness in ourselves and give it expression by doing God's work in the world. The gifts which we give this Christmas season as symbols of God's great gift to us will pass and be forgotten. But the gift of hope so wow and this this is a secular uhf yeah. style station right just a yeah. sort of local news station that's amazing yeah so and then after that message they'd cut to the fireplace which was the the governor's mansion fireplace mm -hmm. and the camera would kind of do like a slow zoom um like you'd start out seeing like the whole mantle the, the, there were stockings on the mantle and then it, in the you know it would slowly zoom in to where you were just seeing the fire mm -hmm. and and then for the next 3 hours they would play christmas music mm -hmm. uh, it is classic christmas music from the 1950s and 60s so yeah so it's like a lot of orchestral kind of big band stuff like mm -hmm. people like the Ray Conniff Singers, uh, Fred Waring and the Pennsylvanians, Percy Faith. Percy Faith is the king of the U-Log. Uh, there's nobody that has more songs in the program than Percy Faith. <laughs> the king of the U-Log. Yeah. <laughs> it's on his tombstone. I've always said that the program, if the program aired with a great video of a fireplace uh, and uh, an inferior soundtrack, uh, it would have not have done very well. But it aired with a great soundtrack. Chip loves Christmas music. Like, mm -hmm. he, at some point, he mentioned his list of top 500 Christmas songs. <laughs> and I, like, was like, what? I didn't even know there were 500 <laughs> Christmas songs, let alone top. Wow. Yeah. That's great. So, yeah, Chip, Chip basically grew up with this Yule Log broadcast. Um, it was a Christmas Eve tradition. And yeah, he and his family used to watch it together, even though they, they actually had a real fireplace. We did actually watch it. We sat and we watched the actual uh, program, the actual uh, footage. Yeah, like you would kind of gather around and put it on and you would all like stare at it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We would watch it like it was a real fireplace. You know, we, actually between the two, it would be on one side of the room. Uh, the TV uh, with the fireplace with the Yulog, and the other side uh, in our family room was the uh, real fireplace, and we were probably watching the Yulog more than we were the real fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> so New Yorkers love this broadcast, and eventually the station decides they need to to reshoot it because the film that they shot it on is is um, deteriorating. Mm -hmm. And it was actually a 17-second loop. Oh, my God. People could see. Like, totally. When, yeah. You can totally see a 17-second oh, loop. Oh, yeah. That's crazy. I know. <laughs> so, and but you remember how, like, the first time they shot it, they, they like, burned the, a hole in <laughs> right. the governor's rug? Right. Well, right. he did not forget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They, they, he would not let them back at Gracie Mansion because of the mishap with the rug. Now they needed, they needed a location. So yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't let them go back there. And somehow, and this part is kind of lost to history. Someone found a very similar looking fireplace, and you'll never guess where it was. They located a, a very close, a similar fireplace in California, of all places, in Palo Alto, and they refilmed it in August of 1970. Uh, during a heat wave in Northern California. Whoa. Bay Area Zone, Palo Alto, California. Take that, New Yorkers. That's awesome. And they, so New Yorkers have been watching our fireplace 
Yeah. For 30 years or something? Yeah. So, so this Palo Alto fire became the Yule log. It aired for 20 years. It's the classic Yule log, not to be confused with the original Yule log. The 1966 Yule log that was shot at Gracie Mansion that aired for those first four years is the original, but it's not the classic because most people don't remember those original uh, years that it aired. Wow. So yeah, this one this one aired for a really long time. So 20 years. Yeah. But then in 1990 Christmas comes and Chip turns on his TV just like he did every year and he turns to channel 11 and it just wasn't on. We were all looking for it, it wasn't on. Uh luckily for me, I just had a feeling that it might not be on forever and I recorded it. <laughs> so yeah, Chip Chip had had a recording. So he, he was fine, but the rest of New York was just out of luck. And people were mad. The station got a ton of letters. So why did they take it off the air after 20 years? So the station got actually got a new program director. The new program director came in and and said, what's this? The log, it's taking up too much commercial time. You know, take it off. Scrooge. Heartless. So, so yeah, so Chip and a few other people actually started a petition to get it back on the air. They set up a website called (laughs) bringbackthelog.com. But yeah, but nothing seemed to persuade the station that it was worth bringing back until actually 9-11. What happened is after the terrorist attacks, Betty Ellen Berlamino, who was the president of the station at the time, felt New Yorkers needed comfort food television. They needed something to remind them of the past, uh, something of, you know, more simple, happier days. So yeah, they, they put it back on um, and it still runs today. It runs... I believe it's an hour on Christmas Eve and then a a few hours on Christmas Day. Um, Mm -hmm. Chip believes very strongly that the best time to watch it is Christmas Eve. And the way he talks about it, it's like it's spirit. It's like spiritual for him. It's like Christmas Eve mass. It's like a vigil, so to speak. But, you know, the cards are sent, the cookies are baked, the gifts are wrapped. And now it's just time to relax and enjoy the solemnity of the moment. Enjoy, you know, the peace and tranquility of Christmas for the crazy Christmas rush on Christmas Day. That's nice. Yeah. Is it the same Palo Alto fire, or did they film something new? I believe they're still using that that same Palo Alto fire, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that's Chip R. Curry. He runs the Bring Back the Log, turned into just the yulelog.com. Um, he's basically the keeper of all things Yule Log. <laughs> and he even helped the TV station add another hour of music to the the broadcast um, because he has this huge Christmas record collection. (laughs) And a shout out to our own Avery Truffleman who first told me about this history and to her dad who I think told her. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Wow. The Yule Log. We'll hear more mini stories from the rest of the 99PI crew as the first episode of 2019. But we will have episodes in the feed for the final two Tuesdays of 2018, even though they land on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. I figured there's a good portion of you who are traveling and resting, but still need nice things to listen to while you might have some time off work. And if you don't have time off work, we'll still be here for you. So stay tuned and Happy New Year. Invisible is Avery Truffleman, Katie Mingle, Kurt Kohlstedt, Delaney Hall, Sharif Youssef, Emmett Fitzgerald, Sean Rial, Taryn Mazza, Joe Rosenberg, Vivian Lee, Sophia Klatsker, and me, Roman Mars. We are a project of 91.7 KALW in San Francisco and produced on Radio Row in beautiful downtown Oakland, California. California.